A new law in Oregon requires that the state's K-12 public schools provide free tampons in both the girls' and boys' bathrooms. <laughs> yes, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, Clavin, you virulent yet strangely lovable patriarchal monster, I suppose now you're going to make all kinds of despicably sexist jokes in the hope of cajoling us all back into a world where men are men and women are women, and they marry one another in order to create healthy families of rambunctious yet honorable boys and loving moral girls who carry both tradition and innovation into a shining new American future. Yeah, that's largely accurate. But still, I'm not making this story up. The Oregon State Education Department says the new tampon law, quote, and as God is my witness, this is a real quote, affirms the right to menstrual dignity for transgender, intersex, non-binary, and two-spirit students, unquote. That sentence reminds me of the time I watched Lord of the Rings on acid, because there's no such thing as elves, I've never taken acid, and so the whole thing is a fantasy start to finish, very much like the concerns of the Oregon Education Department, which operates in a state whose schools are ranked 35 out of 50. But at least now, sniggering eight-year-old boys can stick tampons up their butts and say, look, I'm a girl with a tampon up my butt. The Oregon law is, of course, a result of leftist gender theory, which holds that gender characteristics have nothing to do with a person's physical sex. Now, you well might ask, if gender characteristics and sex are intimately linked in every other mammal on Earth, why do gender theorists believe that when it comes to humans, they magically become distinct? Well, the reason is most gender theorists are women, so they're completely irrational. Unfortunately, when you explain this to gender theorists, they get very angry. It's like telling them their dress makes them look fat. Even if it's true, gender theorists want you to lie about it for some reason. Then they go off and sulk and won't tell you why, because gender theorists believe that if you really love them, you would just somehow know what they're feeling. In general, gender theorists can be very perplexing creatures. Anyway, all of this raises an interesting question. Since boys don't actually have periods, and since transgender, intersex, non-binary, and two-spirit students are exceedingly rare when they exist at all, and since menstrual dignity is not actually a thing, as any real woman will be happy to explain to you at excruciating length, what are Oregon boys supposed to do with all those tampons in their bathrooms? Well, you'll be delighted, but not surprised to hear I have some suggestions. One, they could, they could lay out about 30 or 40 tampons on the bathroom counters, soak them with water, form teams, and then throw them at each other in massive, hilarious, wet tampon battles that they'll remember with fond, nostalgic chuckles for the rest of their lives. Two, they could study them. <laughs> in an effort to figure out what vaginas look like until their parents give them smartphones, whereupon they'll just be able to look at porn. Three, they could use their masculine technical skills to interweave them like Lincoln logs and build elaborate tampon cabins, then soak them with water so that they expand into mansions, symbolizing how our country rose from simple yet heroic beginnings to unprecedented levels of wealth and success until there were leftist gender theorists and everything became a big soggy pile of wet cotton. Or four, they could stick them up their butts, then drop their pants and waggle them at the Oregon State Education Department while shouting, hey, Jagoffs, how about teaching us some math so our schools aren't ranked lower than the ones in Eritrea? Now, I know some feminists who are living completely fulfilling and satisfied feminist lives that are totally imaginary are going to write to me and say, Clavin, you rotten but incredibly alluring sexist, with your old-fashioned attitudes, you just want to keep women in the kitchen barefoot and pregnant. But that is totally untrue. I see absolutely no reason why women shouldn't wear shoes, or at least socks. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky doo Ship-shaped, ipsy-topsy, the world is a bitty zing It's a wonderful day, hooray, hooray, it makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray! Oh, hooray, hooray! 
All right, we are back laughing our way through the fall of the republic. Today, we're going to talk about the lawless violence of the left and how they hope it will win them the midterms. I'll review Dinesh D'Souza's new film, 2000 Mules, and we're going to interview a conservative firebrand out of North Carolina, Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson, who I'm really impressed with. Uh, and also, we're going to talk to Robert Cooperman, who runs the conservative theater in Ohio, where my play, The Uncanny, will be on starting this week. Not this weekend, but next weekend. I uh, hope you'll get tickets at Stage Right Theatrics online. Um, and while I'm talking about such things, you know that I know compelling theater. Let me tell you, there is nothing more captivating than the insight, laughter, and camaraderie to be experienced at a backstage live event. A lot of good theater coming out of this place. And now it's your perfect chance to be there in person for the big show. Join us for Backstage Live on June 29th at the historic Ryman Auditorium in downtown Nashville, Tennessee. Tickets are available now. We've been on a huge winning streak from suing the federal government to stop their tyrannical vaccine mandate to announcing our $100 million challenge to woke Disney DW kids. That makes this the perfect time to get together and celebrate. Join me, Ben Knowles, Matt Walsh, and Daily Wire God King Jeremy Boring for our biggest live event of the year. Tickets are on sale now. Don't miss out. Head over to dailywire.com slash Ryman and get your tickets today. Daily Wire backstage live at the Ryman in Nashville on June 29th. See you there. Uh, also, uh, you want to subscribe, please, to the podcast. Uh, give us a five-star review. That's very helpful. And subscribe to um, my YouTube channel, my personal YouTube channel. It has completely uh, original material you can get there. Uh, and uh, if you ring that little bell... Um, someone you don't know will die. Uh, also, if you leave, if you leave a, um, a comment and it's sufficiently nasty, cruel, uh, bigoted, sexist, all those things, we'll read it on the air because it'll fit right in with the rest of the material. I have two comments I want to read today because they really make an interesting point. The first comment I want to read is, Mr. Clavin, you are the best thing to enter the arena of the internet. This is from Sean you're the best thing to enter the arena of the internet ever, no hyperbole, not that your words are the words of scripture, but simply due to the fact that you are a fallen human being just as I am and articulate with the unparalleled unparall competence that you do. That's one comment. And here's another comment in, in a same, similar vein from Frozen Gamer. He says, thank you as always for the great show, Clavin, even though it's corrupt, racist, and less interesting than playing Barbies with, with my daughter. So you see the same comment gets different, different reactions from uh, both Sides. So talking about going on vacation, I'm worried about going overseas because, you know, if you get COVID, they won't let you back in the country. It's the U.S. It's not the Europeans who do it. They won't let you back in. But wherever you go, you're going to want to have Ring Alarm. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Ring Alarm. I thought it was a video doorbell, unless you've been listening to this commercial <laughs> for weeks. Yes, they do have that wonderful doorbell where you can talk to whoever comes to your door on your app, but they also have an alarm. It's an award-winning home security system with available professional monitoring when you subscribe. You can easily install it yourself. I've done it. And Ring doesn't stop there. They've now got Ring Alarm Pro. Ring Alarm Pro is a next-level security system. CNET calls Ring Alarm Pro a giant leap for home security. Ring combined a home security system and a Wi-Fi router. So it helps protect your home and secure your network with a Ring Protect Pro subscription, which is an amazing deal. You can get professional monitoring for the ultimate peace of mind. If anything happens, professional monitoring will call you and can request emergency services. It's true. Ring Alarm has an award-winning alarm, and this busy summer season to protect your home, you should go pro with Ring Alarm Pro. To learn more, go to ring.com forward slash Clavin. That's ring.com forward slash Clavin. I know what you're wondering. You're saying, that sounds great, but how do you spell Clavin? It's K-L-A-V-A-N. You know, before I begin with my commentary, I just would like to play my favorite video of the week because we've got massive inflation. Uh, our borders have collapsed. Crime is rampant. Uh, mothers can't get formula for their babies. It's a genuine crisis. But Joe Biden actually came out and talked about this. And this is what our, our president said. This is cut six. I went out of gas. I had a flat tire. I, I didn't have enough money for cab fare. My trucks didn't come back to the cleaners. An old friend came in from out of town. Someone stole my car. There was an earthquake. A terrible flood. Locus, it wasn't my fault. I swear to God. <laughs> I'm going, to start, I'm going to start one of those March Madness pools uh, where we try to guess who he's going to blame next for the thing, the disasters that he is causing. So here's what I have to say. 
about what's going on, I want to begin by stating some things that I believe. All right? These are just opinions of mine. I believe that climate change is not an existential threat to the Earth. Uh, I think the science is really clear about this, and I think we should obviously take care of the environment, but destroying our fossil fuels industry uh, when there's nothing to replace it with is elitist madness. It's just a crazy thing to do. Uh, I don't believe that the dysfunction in poor black communities is the result of systemic racism, and I don't believe it's the leg legacy of slavery. Uh, I think those are actually provably false. Uh, I think that poor black Americans are suffering from cultural dysfunction, which was largely created and is encouraged and worsened by a Democrat party uh, that has just given up on them, that has no faith in uh, our uh, in black Americans. Uh, it, it lives off their dependence and it uses fear and lies and destructive programs to buy their votes. Um, I believe that transgenderism is a vanishingly rare disorder. It has no place at the center of our policies or even our conversations. Uh, if you feel out of place in your body, I have nothing but sympathy for you. Uh, I feel out of place being a 20-year-old major league center fielder in the body of an aging author. Uh, but if you believe that you're actually a different sex than you are, I still, have, I still have sympathy for you, but you're mentally ill. It is a mental illness to think that things are true that are not true. Uh, and one more, let me just do one more opinion, uh, because I know I make a lot of sexist jokes, as I did in the, in the opening, but that's because I happen to love the differences between men and women, as I think most of us do. For most of us, the differences between men and women are one of the chief joys of life, one of the chief consolations of life, and, and they're all kind of funny and silly. So I make, I make the jokes, but I obviously, and anyone who knows me knows this, I believe in complete uh, human rights for women, and I respect the right of individual women to make choices for their lives, obviously, but... Having said that, having said that, I think uh, that married at-home mothers are not just the core of a successful free society. I think in some sense, married at-home mothers are the guarantors and creators of a truly human life. And I think they should be elevated and honored and encouraged and assisted by the culture and even by the government if that's necessary. But again, your choice is your choice. Now, those are a few of my opinions, and it's possible that some of them are wrong. Uh, that happened once. It was 1967, uh, but that was in another country, and besides, the wench is dead, right? But here's what's not possible. This is literally impossible. It is literally impossible that my opinions are ill-informed because I'm not ill-informed. It's literally impossible that they're bigoted because I'm not a bigoted person, and it's literally impossible that they're cruel or the product of bad will. None of those things are, are going to be coming out of my mouth. I'm a well-read person. Uh, I have all my flaws. I have millions and millions of flaws. But in general, just in comparing me to the average person, I'm hardworking. I'm joyfully religious. I'm a faithful husband, a devoted father. I, you know, I wish nobody ill, man or woman, whatever color you are. I, I want you to thrive. And I think basically I'm a positive addition to this country, which is still the last best hope of humankind. So... All of which is to say, if you disagree with me, we have a lot we can talk about, and there's nothing I love more than a friendly or, or even fierce but friendly uh, discussion of the issues. But if you call me names, if you try to silence me, if you try to intimidate me or ruin my life or my career or my reputation, or if you try to blacklist me, or if you threaten me with violence, or if you try to uh, commit violence against me, the problem is 100% you. It is not some untoward thing I might have said by accident. It's not something I tweeted when I was 15 years old. It's nothing like that. It's all you. It's all your problem. You're a small-minded, mean-spirited, hateful, un-American thug who is making everything worse for everybody, which is just another way of saying you are a woke leftist. Leftists have a lot of slogans about violence. They say speech is violence. They say silence is violence. They say hate is violence. Bigotry is violence. There's only one thing they don't seem to think is violence, and that's violence, at least when they are doing it. And I know, I know, you know, January 6th and everything like that, which every conservative in authority condemned, and I have condemned, but the left turned whole cities into rubble and ashes after the death of a drug addict punk, George Floyd, at the hands of the police, which was a totally anomalous act of reckless policing, and they pretended it was some kind of symbol of a national state of mind. 
The press lied about the violence. They said it was mostly peaceful violence. The Democrats unanimously failed to condemn it at their convention. Not one of them stood up and said, oh, they're burning down Antifa and BLM are burning down your cities and killing people. And that is a bad thing. They failed to condemn and even they even encouraged physical intimidation and assaults on people in the Trump administration. They won't even condemn violent crime, violent street crime. crime. They have leftist DAs who say, oh, no, we're decriminalizing that. <laughs> Which is great. That is a great idea, to criminalize crime. Dave Chappelle was attacked on stage, and they didn't even charge the attacker with a felony. People are being gunned down in Chicago like ducks in a shooting gallery, and the idiot mayor is calling for violence against pro-lifers. These leftists, they've turned against free speech, which is the essence of freedom. They have ruined the lives and careers of people who disagree with them. They've accepted the absolutely immoral nonsense of critical theory, critical race theory, critical sex theory, queer theory, all these things. They've accepted that as fact. They've declared that it's a fact, and they've used it as a trash, third-rate philosophy, and they've used it as the basis of a demonic system of cultural oppression in which there's no grace for historical wrongs, uh, there's no forgiveness for errors, for personal errors, and there's not even the ability of one person to communicate with another person because our words no longer are no longer accepted to mean what they have always meant. Now, in the past, in Weimar, Germany, for instance, in 1930 Spain, this kind of leftist oppression was met by fascist oppression and fascist violence. And we always talk about the violence of fascism, uh, you know, in, in Spain and obviously the rise of Hitler, and that, that was awful. But we always leave out the violent and oppressive communism and leftism that gave the fascism its excuse and its reason for being. Now, obviously, we cannot let this happen here. I mean, it is, we are in a fight between leftists and fascists. There are no good guys. And I have no point of sympathy, as I've said before, with the conservatives. Some conservatives in this country have become enamored with the kind of blood and soil uh, European style conservatism, authoritarian conservatism. And my feeling is screw your blood, screw your soil. I am a conservative, as I've told you a million times, I'm a conservative because I'm a liberal, because I want to conserve the Declaration and the Constitution, which are the greatest political creations of the greatest culture that has so far existed on Earth. And that means that I can't go along with the logic of some conservatives, some of whom write to me and say, they do it, so we have to do it too. I can't do what they're doing because I'm fighting for something different than they're fighting for. They're fighting for authoritarian power, the power to police your speech and the power to shut down your career and the problem, power to force you to believe what they believe. And I am fighting for freedom. Their weapons are rocks and intimidation and threats and censorship and cancel culture. And the only weapons we have, the people who agree with me have, are the common sense of the American people, 250 years of American institutions, the rule of law, and the courage to put those things to use and the faith that they'll work. If we lose the courage to speak to the people and trust them to make decisions, we've surrendered, that, that's it, We're, it's over. If we lose the belief in our institutions and the faith that our elections can still work fairly, we have nothing to go for but civil war. And if we lose faith in every political strategy but violence, it is the worst outcome of all because we will suffer the one thing that is worse than being beaten by the left, we will become the left, and then we've lost everything. If you're anything like me, you hate the grocery store. Broken bags, bare shelves, it's all such a chore. So I go online to goodranchers.com. It makes meat buying easy, and their steaks are the bomb. The best part is, it's all American meat. It ships straight to your door. The service can't be beat. You can buy a single box, but I think you should subscribe because their meat really rocks, and store-bought meat isn't the vibe. They'd never add hormones or antibiotics, lock in your price with a subscription. It's perfect economics. Their beef is delicious, chicken better than organic, grocery store sourcing is suspicious, and they're starting to panic. You see, 85% of meat is shipped from overseas. American farmland is being bought up by the Chinese. Shop at GoodRanchers.com if you want American meat. Getting that box straight to my door is my favorite treat. Use code CLAVEN for two free pounds of ground Wagyu beef with your order. Go buy some meat from Good Ranchers. They're my show's tastiest supporter. God, I love rap. So Gerard Baker, one of my favorite columnists, uh, who is actually finally going to come on the show. He ghosted us a while back, but he finally is going to come back. Uh, he wrote a column in the Wall Street Journal this week. Democrats 2022 Midterm Playbook, Falsehoods and Fear. 
And his point is that the lawlessness and intimidation and lies surrounding the death of uh, George Floyd is the, the Dem- worked to their advantage. And they think that they can use this again in this possible reversal of Roe v. Wade. And maybe that was the reason that the decision was leaked. And here's what he says. He says, the Black Lives Matter campaign two years ago ranks as one of the most effective demonstrations of extra-constitutional political activism in at least half a century. The far left, representative of only a tiny strand of opinion in the U.S., and that's really important, succeeded in orchestrating a campaign of disinformation, intimidation, moral blackmail, and outright violence to create a political climate favorable to its interests, seizing on the murder of a black man by a police officer to create a narrative that the U.S. is institutionally depraved. It managed to turn the blame onto the incumbent Republican president and his party and helped elect a president in Congress that have been eager advocates of their wider cause. And he thinks that that's what's going on now uh, as, you know, they start to be outraged about um, the possible reversal of Roe v. Wade, which, remember, will just send the decision on abortion law back to the states, back to the people and their representatives in the uh, states. Now, John Dalty, my pal over at Breitbart, who's always a really got really interesting takes on things. I'm not sure whether he's right about this or not. He says he thinks this is failing. He says he thinks that the outrage that they're trying to inspire over abortion is a dud. Here's what he writes in his wonderful style. He says, he says, I know a few hundred yahoos descended on the homes of a few Supreme Court justices, an out-and-out felony encouraged by this lawless and deranged White House, but a few hundred yahoos will come out and protest anything. If Chipotle raised the price of guacamole, you could get that many yahoos out. This isn't guacamole. This is the left sacrament of abortion. This is the third rail of third rails. This is civil war time. This is, hey, where the hell is everyone? So he says that people are not coming out. But people are, you know, protesting outside of uh, the homes of Supreme Court justices. And Merrick Garland, a corrupt hack, our attorney general, uh, is doing nothing about it. So help me, Mitch McConnell may get into heaven on just by virtue of having kept Merrick Garland off the Supreme Court. I mean, St. Peter is going to say to him, so you were selling out our interest to China, but (laughs) I don't know, Merrick Garland, all right, you're in. White House spokeswoman Jen Psaki is saying that these demonstrations are simply great. Here's cut nine. I know that there's an outrage right now, I guess, about uh, protests that have been peaceful to date, and we certainly continue to encourage that outside of judges' homes, and that's the president's position. But the silence is pretty deafening about all of the other intimidation that we've seen to a number of people. So I'd like to think that what she was trying to say, I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt, because uh, not that she deserves it but uh, morally, but I still think that what she was trying to say is that she's encouraging the nonviolence. But this is the same party that knelt on the floor of the Capitol while Antifa and BLM were burning the cities down, and they've turned stores in San Francisco into shopping malls for looters. Uh, They like the violence. They think it'll scare us into compliance. They think it'll scare us into doing what they want. And it's an actual, the violence is an actual expression of leftism. Bill Barr, who I really admire, I know a lot of uh, always Trumpers think that Bill Barr kind of sold Trump out, but I think he's just been straight arrow and spoken his opinion on both sides, whatever it was. And he was talking to Jesse Waters on Fox, and this is what he said about the the, the in, attempt to intimidate um, Supreme Court justices and the potential violence of the left. This is cut four. They've been using violence as a political tool, and it's been seeping into the to our system. It started with all the attacks on Trump supporters in early in the campaign in the spring of 2016. You remember there are a whole series of attacks mm-hmm. uh, in uh, Costa Mesa and San Jose and Albuquerque and so forth. And uh, it just kept on going. That was perfectly fine to go and beat up Trump supporters at political rallies. That was the insinuation of, of politics and the whole the whole rhetoric of resistance suggests that the government is 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 not a legitimate government anything goes and that's essentially what the left is all about anything goes because you know they're holy they're virtuous and they know what they're they're leading history they're the vanguard of history and they know what's best for everyone so if you oppose them if you get in their way you you can be rolled over the ends justify the means and this is the ultimate expression of it
It, it, it's a really, it's a very concise description of what's going on because the whole point of liberalism is that nobody has the, the final answer. We know there is a final answer, but we get to it by half measures. We argue with each other. We compromise. You know, this is the thing. I'm not looking to not compromise with people uh, who are a little left of center. I believe we have to compromise with them. I know they're, they're good people, but they're supporting this lawlessness. They're supporting this radicalism. They're supporting the death of the liberalism they believe in because through... Um, debate and argument and uh, free speech and compromise, we move forward. I mean, all the things that we have, all the actual uh, improvements in life that we have, we get through this argument. If we don't, we have to resort to war. Nobody wants it. By the way, I would like to just compare, pardon me for a moment, I just like to compare the protests of the left, especially outside Supreme Court Justice's House, which is a federal crime, to the protest of Hollywood actor James Cromwell uh, from Succession, who went in a, uh, to a Starbucks and su super glued his hand to the counter to protest the price of non-dairy milk. I don't want to say the guy is like a privileged Westerner uh, complaining about nothing, but uh, here's Cromwell making his, his grand statement after super gluing his hand to a Starbucks counter. It's cut seven. Starbucks has admitted that cow's milk is the company's biggest contributor to its carbon footprint. And Starbucks agrees that vegan milks are a big part of the solution, but it still charges for them. Native and African Americans cannot digest cow's milk. Starbucks makes them pay more. Stop this. <laughs> it's like, these guys, there's so much privilege coming out of their eyeballs. But listen, to be serious for a minute, if every Hollywood actor, every Hollywood actor super glued himself to the retail outlet of every woke corporation in America, all our problems would be solved. You know, with anything in life, there's one way to do it, and then maybe there's a smarter way to do it. And you might already be investing in cryptocurrency, but did you know you can trade Bitcoin, Ethereum, and over 80 other cryptocurrencies in a tax-advantaged IRA? With an Alto Crypto IRA, you can trade crypto like Bitcoin and avoid or defer the taxes. Get into investing in crypto and do it in a tax-advantaged retirement account. Alto Crypto IRA is the easiest way to get crypto into an IRA. Trade all you want without the tax headache. Create an account in just a few minutes and invest with as little as 10 bucks and no setup charges. Plus, there are multiple ways to fund your account. Make a cash contribution, transfer cash from an existing IRA, or roll over an old 401k. Get secure trading 24-7 through Alto's integration with Coinbase. There are 150 plus coins available, including Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Cardano. Open an Alto Crypto IRA account with as little as 10 bucks. Just go to altoira.com slash Andrew. That's A-L-T-O-I-R-A.com slash Andrew. Start investing in cryptocurrency today. Go to altoira.com slash Andrew. So here's Senator Cotton's response <laughs> to uh, Senator Tom Cotton's response to the protests outside the homes of um, of Supreme Court justices. Remember, this is a federal crime. Intimidating justices to make them change their minds is a federal crime. And here's what Tom Cotton says about it. Cut five. They shouldn't just condemn these protests and tell the protesters to go to the Supreme Court building or some other public location. They should enforce federal law because there is a federal law that explicitly prohibits protesting at the homes of judges or jurors or prosecutors. Joe Biden should come out today and say that federal law enforcement will put an end to these protests tonight. If any person gets close to a justice's home, they should be arrested and charged with a federal crime. If Joe Biden and Merrick Garland won't do that, and there is violence against one of these justices, they will be responsible for the crimes that they allowed to happen by refusing to enforce federal law because they didn't want to apply the rule of law evenly against their political adversaries. Now, he's absolutely 100% right about this, but... You'll notice that, let's say, in Virginia, Glenn Youngkin, the governor, is being very restrained about it. And I think that's actually good strategy. It's one thing for the federal government to go in and arrest people for committing a federal crime. But if a Republican governor does it, he gives them a talking point. And they don't have that now. So you know, even, even though Gerard Baker is right and this is their strategy, I think their strategy is really misguided. I think the left is making a big mistake here. Um, 
and people aren't turning out. I mean, Joe Biden was not elected for his left-wing activism. He was elected to bring back normalcy after the Trump-Obama era. And it was both Trump and Obama who ended normalcy. And Biden was actually meant to bring back kind of the old days of kind of steady, you know, guiding the ship. And instead, he's gone in this radical, I'm going to change the country thing, which was exactly the opposite of what he said. And everything, as always, everything the left touches turns to crap. And so he's, you know, got nothing left but blaming everybody about it. And now any violence that happens is on his watch. And babies, you know, this is a serious thing. Mothers can't find formula. And, you know, that, that's, a, that's a really serious thing. And that's a supply chain issue that these guys should have been paying attention to instead of ending oil drilling leases in Alaska, which they just did this week, making our gas prices go up even higher and increasing the chances of rolling blackouts in the winter. I mean, just everything they're doing is wrong. We've got, you know, the inflation is out of, absolutely out of control and they keep spending money and they're blaming ultra MAGA. Ultra MAGA is their new phrase. Everything is the fault of ultra MAGA. And they're depending on the press to keep you ignorant. Right, right now, two-thirds of Americans, I read in one poll, uh, think that the end of Roe v. Wade means that abortion will be illegal everywhere. It's just going to now be impossible to get an abortion. And every journalist in the country should be ashamed of that statistic. But the problem is every real journalist in the country works now for the Daily Wire or in Brett Baer's uh, newsroom, and the rest of them are lying corporate hacks who are proud of that. Here's Jake Tapper. I mean, just watch this. This is how they're covering the abortion thing. Here's Jake Tapper interviewing Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves, who wants uh, strict restrictions on abortion if Roe is, in fact, overturned. This is cut 13. What about a fetus that has serious or fatal abnormalities that will not allow that fetus to live outside the womb? Is the state of Mississippi going to force those girls and women who have this tragedy inside them to carry the child to term? Are you going to force them to do that? I, th I think by this tragedy inside them, what he meant was this baby, this child, this potential human being. I think that's what Jake was trying to say there. But the point of it, it is, it is a kind of misinformation. The left is always complaining about misinformation to focus on the exception while ignoring the rule. Over 90% of abortions are freely chosen and have to do with convenience, basically. And, and... You know, there are. This is reading uh, Justice Clarence Thomas, as quoted in the journal by Jason Riley. Uh, he said, "You know, there are areas of New York City in which black children are more likely to be aborted than they are to be born alive, and are up to eight times more likely to be aborted than white children in the same area." Uh, blacks. This is something that is happening in black areas because of what I said: cultural dysfunction, the end of marriage, uh, the end of responsibility, which the left has encouraged with their feminism and with their idea that to criticize. You know, Democrat, Democrats treat black Americans, our, our fellow Americans, our fellow citizens, Democrats treat them like animals. And whenever you say that, they say, oh, you're calling black people animals, but I'm not. I'm saying Democrats treat our fellow American citizens who are black like animals, and it's disgusting. They basically say, oh, if you can't criticize, you know, out of wedlock births with black, why, why the hell not? Oh, you can't put criminals in jail if they're black. Why the hell not? They're human beings. They're our fellow citizens. They're responsible as just as responsible as we are, and we should treat them that way because that's the only way to respect Expect people is to treat them like you expect them to act lawfully and like human beings and, and well and morally. That's the way we treat each other. That's the way we should treat everybody, no matter what the color of their skin. But Democrats have invented this new rule where suddenly one portion of the population is not responsible to the others, and it is just absolutely disgusting and makes things worse and worse and worse. The problem they have is they cannot control the um, they can't control information anymore. And that's what everything is about. You know, I, I, I was saying to somebody the other day, I think it was uh, Dinesh D'Souza's publicist, I was saying, you know, uh, you know, they keep taking Dinesh's movie down, 2,000 Mules down. They're saying, well, it's misinformation. I said, the left should hold a beauty contest in which the girl who tells the truth the most is crowned misinformation. <laughs> because that's, the, that's their idea of misinformation, is truth that they don't want to hear. The thing is, that's almost everything that's happening, I think, is, is a question of information. I think everything that's happening is a result of the Internet, which has broken the monopoly of the left on information, and the left is fighting tooth and nail to get it back. That's why this Elon Musk thing is such a, you know, they're in such a panic over it, uh, because they, they started to win in terms of taking over um, 
social media, Twitter, Facebook, Google, YouTube, all of these things, they've, they've got them a monopoly on them, and that's what they want. They want a monopoly on information. And they keep saying this thing, whenever you point this out, they say, well, you're banning books. And what they mean by you're banning books is that we are saying that a kindergarten or a K through uh, six school shouldn't have sexually explicit books in its library, which is not banning books unless you happen to be a beast who is obsessed with teaching your sexual perversion to young people so you feel better about yourself, so you can have at least somebody who's not looking at you like the weirdo that you are. And that's not banning books. That is saying that children get certain things and they don't get other things, which is simply a healthy way to run a society. And of course, everybody else can look at whatever book you want, and I certainly believe that. But this is this whole thing about misinformation and disinformation and fact checking and now the ministry of truth that are going to tell us that any time you use uh, you criticize a left wing woman that you're really secretly calling her a bitch it's just a dog whistle for that that's what they're going to tell us now all of that stuff all of that stuff is about the internet it is about the fact that the internet broke the flow of information because the thing is when you see them when you see them you, they get uglier and uglier. Let, let's take a look at this Nina Jankowicz, who is um, uh, supposed to run this Ministry of Disinformation and Homeland Security, and get her idea of what disinformation looks like. This is cut 14. We've got gendered abuse, which is the, the typical sort of stuff that you see that any woman in public life has experienced before, picking apart your appearance, uh, using gendered slurs against you. Then a subset of that is gendered disinformation. So that's false or misleading information um, that uses gendered tropes. So it might be, for instance, this is a big one that we tracked in the report, Kamala Harris slept her way to the top. Or it might be uh, that uh, Jacinda Ardern, another one that we found, is actually a man, uh, that she couldn't be in the position of power that she's in. She is uh, a trans man. And that's why she, she is where she is. So this is the woman who's going to be running the Censorship Bureau of Homeland Security who thinks that to say that the uh, Kamala Harris slept her way to the top, which she did, uh, is, is somehow disinformation. The truth is disinformation. The reason the truth is disinformation is because when you see them, it gets very ugly. The Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, was uh, at, at the Senate uh, this week. And she was answering, supposed to be answering questions about, the, you know, inflation and the rising interest rates and all this. But Democrats started questioning her about abortion because they think this is their winning issue. This is the big issue. They're going to get the outrage. They're going to get the violence. And they're going to win the midterms. They're going to turn the midterms around. And she got into it with Senator Tim Scott about why abortion was good for the economy. An amazing, ugly argument. And his response was, as far as I was concerned, like dropping an atom bomb. He might as well just have dropped an atom bomb on her. Here's cut one. In many cases, um, abortions are of teenage women, um, particularly low income and often black, who um, aren't in a position to be able to care for children, have um, unexpected pregnancies, and it deprives them of the ability often to continue their education to later participate in the workforce. So there, there is a spillover into labor force participation. Yeah. But, yeah. And uh, it means that children will grow up in poverty yeah. and do, do worse themselves. Thank and you. Let me, let me is, just this claim is my not time harsh. on the topic. This I, is the truth. I'll just simply say that as a guy raised by a black woman in abject poverty, I'm thankful to be here as a United States senator. <laughs> One sentence, boom, she's gone. Because that's the story the baby can't tell. That's the story a dead baby can't tell. You can tell all the stories of Jake Tapper stories you want about the woman who's in this trouble and the woman who's in that trouble, but the baby can't tell the story that I can redeem the problem through my life, through my beautiful life, through Tim Scott's beautiful life. Just So remember, you know, the thing is, the left wouldn't use violence if they could use speech. They wouldn't be trying to censor us if the truth were on their side. And I think that... the it's really obvious to me that the tide is turning in our favor uh, culturally. Uh, our elites have lost our way, but we, we, it's up to us. It's up to us to act with respect for people on the left of center, with a willingness to compromise. But most of all, no fear. We have to have no fear, and we have to take on these illiberal, small-minded, violent, crypto-communist, woke pieces of garbage. We have to shut them down. They have to be defeated so that the rest of us can get on with being America. spend a lot of time sitting. You know, writers have to sit a lot. 
and you want office chairs that are great. You want a terrific office chair. It's important to invest in the right chair to spend the hours you spend sitting. I, I use an X chair when I play the piano because I'm sitting in front of the piano, I'm taking piano lessons. X chair makes your time sitting not only more productive, but it is honestly a wonderfully a wonderful place to sit for any reason. Not only does X chair's patented dynamic variable lumbar offer the ultimate customized support, but your X chair can give you a massage. It can heat up or cool down. And now, thanks to X chair's new armrest, you can even adjust the armrest to the perfect position, which is important when you're playing the piano, by the way. All these unique X chair features help the hours at your desk fly by in complete comfort. I love my X chair. It really is a terrific place to do what I do. Go to X chair. Claven.com now. That's letter X, chair. How do you spell Claven? I know you're wondering. It's K-L-A-V-A-N.com. Or you can call 1-844-4X-CHAIR for 100 bucks off your order. X-CHAIR has a 30-day guarantee of complete comfort. You can finance your purchase for as little as 30 bucks a month. XChairClaven.com. So a lot of people uh, have been writing me and asking me why I haven't said anything about Dinesh D'Souza's new film, 2000 Mules, which is uh, about uh, whether or not the last election, the last presidential election was stolen and how it was and uh, deals with some very specific videos and information that they have. And the reason was I hadn't seen it I, and I had a hard time getting it in um, online, but I finally worked with their publicity people uh, to get a hold of it and watched it this week. And uh, I have uh, asked Lisa, our producer, to invite Dinesh on. Uh, Dinesh is always welcome on the show and uh, he's having a hard time. He says, he says that on Fox News, I don't want to attack our friends on Fox News, but he says they will not mention the name of the film. They won't mention the name of the film. They'll have people on from uh, True the Vote, who is at the center of the film, Catherine Engelbrecht, uh, and uh, they'll have her on, but they'll tell her she can't mention the name of the film. Uh, Dinesh can come on here and mention the name of that film or any other film he wants and say anything that he has on his mind anytime. Uh, but I've invited him on specifically for this. But I want to talk about the film uh, because I think it's an important uh an important film, an important issue, obviously, and a lot of people are still very exercised about the last election, feel it was stolen. And I've told you my opinion, and I'll discuss it again as we go on. Before I before I say anything about it, though, I want to talk about uh, just briefly the, um, the difference between high criticism and low criticism. I mean, there's a difference, um, you know, because there's always more to say about what's negative about a film than, or any piece of work than there is about what's positive. Uh, and, but there's a difference, a big difference between high criticism and low. And you can picture it like where you say to a friend, you know, you guys, you and your wife uh, do great. You're so loving with one another. And, you know, but I just, just want to make a suggestion that maybe she'd like, uh, you know, to receive flowers every now and again, you know, because you never, you're the kind of guy who never thinks about that. That's, that's high criticism. Low criticism is stop beating your wife or I'm going to take you outside and kick your head in, right? That's different. So it's the same thing when you say this is a really good film with a lot of great stuff in it, but here are my comments. Uh, that and when you say this film stinks. And I, this this is high criticism. I really uh, thought this film needed to be made. Full disclosure, I knew all about the videos that it was about. I hadn't seen them, but they had been described to me in great detail. I knew they existed. Uh, I have met Catherine from True the Vote. Uh, she probably doesn't remember, but I met her in uh, Santa Barbara uh, at the Bell's house, one of the big, uh, the Snow's house. I mean, one of the big uh, donors out there. Uh, and uh, I have a lot of faith in her. I do. I believe she is a straightforward person. She kind of came to prominence uh, after the Obama administration used the IRS to shut down the Tea Party. Uh, and true, the vote was to make sure elections stay f uh, free and fair. And you remember that because Obama came out and said, heads will roll. And then it was like not a, not a scintilla of corruption at the IRS. Uh, it was a corrupt and terrible uh, abuse of that uh, agencies, that powerful agency's power. Um, so here is what True the Vote did. Uh, very interesting thing is that they, this is all legal. They paid for information that was legally available of apps on phones that can be tracked, location tracked. And so you could see where people were going by tracking the applications on their phones. And they found phones from certain areas Obviously, they were limited in their funds, but they found phones from certain areas, including Atlanta, uh, Philadelphia, I think Phoenix was one of them, where people uh, had gone by uh, drop boxes, ballot boxes, again and again and again, which they found suspicious in and of itself. Uh, and they, they then correlated that 
with movements that showed that these people were going to uh, nonprofit organizations, which they I don't think they name them in the film, unless I missed it, but I'm pretty sure they don't name them in the film, but nonprofit organizations that they felt might be involved in political corruption and stuffing ballot boxes. So they've got people who are visiting um, these boxes again and again and again, and they are uh, correlated with movements of people uh, who have gone, gone, gone to these nonprofits. And they found over 2,000 people who visited the drop boxes a lot. And then, also legal, they got the what was public information. They got the security footage from some of these drop boxes. And the footage is hilariously suspicious. If you, if you find corruption hilarious, as I do, uh, I don't know why, but I do, um, it, it's pretty funny. It's people coming up in the dead of night, 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, some of them wearing rubber gloves, um, dropping, you know, more than one ballot into the box. Now, you are allowed in the, in the states that they were in, you were allowed to drop ballots from your family into a box. So you could show up with four or five. And these are not people dropping coming by with like a thousand ballots or anything like that. They're coming by with five or six or, or more ballots. But they're doing it at the dead of night. Uh, some of them are wearing gloves. One of them takes a picture of himself, which they speculate was so he would be paid by the nonprofit. And they're calling them mules because mules are the guys who are used by drug dealers to carry drugs, uh, you probably know, into the country, to smuggle drugs into the country. They call mules. So they're smuggling these people in. And there is no question, there is no question in my mind that some of these videos, the videos that they show, and they only show maybe four or five different people doing this. But there's no question that this is a, these, these are videos of Democrats being Democrats, namely lying, cheated, and pieces of garbage. I mean, the Democrats uh, have been, because they are urban politicians, they have been very, very good at building urban machines uh, that the GOP traditionally doesn't have. As I always say, it's not that we're better people intrinsically. We're all fallen creatures. But you know, when you talk about the big political machines, you're talking about Chicago, you're talking about Boss Tweed, you're talking about the Democrats. They have been stuffing ballot boxes. Lyndon Johnson was a past master at it. He used to walk through cemeteries taking down people's names uh, so he could get them to vote. Uh, and that there's no question that they are uh, doing that, that they are basically getting videos of people who are doing that. They then go on to say in the video, in the film, in 2000 Mules, that these, they believe that what they got if you extrapolate from just the number of people they found, these 2,000 mules, uh, that if you extrapolate the number of votes, times they visited these boxes and use that as the number of votes they may have put in each time they went to the box, that Trump would have won the election. Now, the strongest argument for the film, I mean, the film is really entertaining and the videos are worth seeing and just uh, talking to it uh, and uh, and Dinesh is, you know, is in it with uh, a lot of people I know and love, uh, including Gorka and, uh, you know, just all the people from Salem, Eric Metaxas and Dennis Prager, all wonderful people who discuss these things. Um, and the strongest arguments for the film are the bogus fact checks that have come out against it. Uh, the AP and the Washington Post put out these fact checks where they said, you know, oh, you can't track phones that closely. And yes, you can. That's just a lie. That is not true. And what's f funny about it is these are the same techniques that the feds used to torment and arrest the January 6th protesters. They found, they had obviously been looking at people's phone movements. They found the people who they thought were going to be dangerous at the January 6th protest. Then they went and found out where they were and they went and arrested them because they knew they had been in the protest. Um, so it's just, it's just ridiculous. They're using the same techniques that were used on January 6th. And if they're good enough for them, it's, uh, it's good enough for this. The, the lies of the left are the most powerful thing the right has because they, they open the film with playing people saying this, this is the most secure election ever. And we know it was nothing like even close to the most secure election ever. Uh, I, and I blame partially the Trump administration for letting this happen. They, the Democrats use COVID to extend the possibility of votes, to increase the possibility of fraud. The New York Times, right up until the day that Trump protested it, uh, said that there's more chance of fraud with mail-in votes. And then suddenly they said, no, mail-in votes are the most secure things either. Uh, it, was, it was a rigged election in the sense of um, destroying, you know, of suppressing Hunter Biden's laptop story in the sense of telling lies about Trump's Russian collusion and organized uh, 
you know, conspiracy of lies uh, and all that. But, but was it a stolen election? That is, that is the question. And I have to say, in my opinion, the weakest part of the film is that argument. And I, in a lot of ways, I think Dinesh might have thought not to do it because when he calculates that you can extrapolate from these 2,000 people to Trump winning the election, uh, it's flimsy. Uh, it's flimsy mathematically. Uh, for one thing, you know, I've had Henry Olson on and people get angry at Henry because he doesn't believe the election was stolen. But Henry is the best numbers guy I know. He really is. I mean, he is. He's not he's not the best numbers guy. Uh, he's one of the best numbers guy. He's up there with anybody. But he's one of the he is the best numbers guy when it comes to watching polls. And he writes this column for The Washington Post. And Henry Olson points out that if Democrats stuffed the ballot boxes in large urban areas in 2020, there would be an unexplained increase in turnout in those areas. And the same would be true for areas with higher rates of mail voting if uh, the new practice gave rise to voter fraud. Uh, if Trump's fraud theories were true, that share would have increased at a greater rate in counties where the ballot boxes were the allegedly stuffed, were allegedly stuffed or in those with the largest share of mailed, uh, mailed ballots. But that's not what happened. That is not what happened. Uh, the turnout in Philadelphia and other major areas was pretty much what you would expect. Trump won Pennsylvania by a hair when he won it, and he lost it by a hair when he lost it. And the votes that he lost were mostly in suburban white areas. I mean, that is where he got hit. And so the numbers do not hold up. Now, I've, I have said the same thing forever, which is that if you want to overturn an election, you have to do it in a court of law. And, and by the way, that's, this is not on Dinesh. Dinesh is not trying to make a case worthy to go into a court of law. He's trying to make a documentary and, and put his case forward. And he puts his case forward, but this was, I thought, his, his, the weakest part uh, were, were the numbers. And I, I do think we have to remember before, if you, if you I, I have an open mind. And I will be convinced when I'm convinced, but I'm not convinced that the election was stolen. And if you've been convinced by each stage where they said, oh, we're going to unleash the Kraken and we're going to get the Dominion machines and this and that. And if each time you thought, yes, this time it's going to be, you know, we're going to find out this and they're going to reverse the election. And then you found out that each time those things were untrue and yet you still are buying into the next thing. You, you really should question whether you are wish casting, whether you're uh, this is wishful thinking. The film is entertaining. The film is worthwhile. The information is important. I don't believe they proved the case that the election was stolen. I, I simply do not. And I'm, again, Dinesh can come on here anytime and argue with me. Uh, I love to see him. He's a great guy. And I'm happy to hear his, his refutation of that. Um, but in terms of pure politics, I think the question we have to ask ourselves, uh, is this a winning issue? And I do not believe it was. That nice Andrew Clavin, if you remember him, he told you that we were going to lose Georgia. We were going to lose the majority in the Senate because Trump would not let this go because his butthurt and his narcissism. And look, you can't say that he is not an egotistical guy, was so great that he would not let this go even when it was time to move on. In politics, it's the future that matters. I know, I understand people being angry. I think it's important for history that we find out the truth. I think it's important for justice that we find out the truth. But if you think this is the political issue that is going to shift the elections uh, in our direction, you are absolutely wrong. It is not. There is no way they are ever going to prove this in court. Jenna Ellis was very honest about this. Once it's done, it's done. There's no way they're going to prove it in court. And so I just think we should, you know, chill. It's fine to get the information. I'm glad they made the, uh, the documentary. I think the censorship of these things is making it all much, much more plausible. The fact that uh, all of, all of um, the media is censoring, it makes it much more plausible. Even the Wall Street Journal always refers to Trump's false claims. I do not think it's been proven that they're false, but I don't think it's been proven that they're true. Watch the film. It's really worthwhile. Pay attention to where things go right and where they go wrong uh, and hold it to account. But it's a really entertaining film. And True the Vote is an excellent organization. And again, Dinesh is welcome to come on and refute it. So I would say good film, interesting information, doesn't prove its case that the election was stolen. So here is a new sponsor that is dear to my heart because, you know, we send our guys and our girls overseas uh, to serve in our nation's wars. And when they come back, sometimes we're not there for them. So I'm excited to talk about a company that really is making a difference for our nation's veterans, One More Wave. One More Wave uses surf therapy to help veterans stay active, engaged, and connected. The founder of One More Wave, Alex West, is a retired Navy SEAL who noticed that for many veterans, especially those with adaptive needs, standard off-the-shelf surfboards and equipment were off the table. So he created a team of surfboard artists and surf instructors to work with 
grant recipients to design the custom equipment for their experience, level, and physical needs. Since 2015, One More Wave has empowered over 500 veterans to find healing and community through surf therapy by providing customized surfing equipment and community. But to keep on going, we need your support. Help fund 10 new surf therapy grants by going to one mwave.com slash daily wire. Sign up to become a monthly sustaining donor. The average veteran grant costs 2,500 bucks and every tax deductible donation counts. Help us continue to support those brave men and women who have given so much for this nation. Visit one mwave.com slash daily wire and become a sustaining member today. One More Wave is a 501c3, and your donation is tax deductible. Please visit 1mwave.com for more information. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, my play, my first produced play, The Uncanny, is going to be produced uh, by Stage Right Theatrics in Dublin, Ohio. And Ohio, and the way this came about, I think it's been like about eight years ago, if not more, I was in one of these me- these endless conversations among conservatives about the culture. Uh, and one of the people on the call was uh, Robert Cooperman, who runs this theater, uh, conservative theater, which I think is almost an oxymoron. And I, th- after the call was over, I thought, you know, we're, I'm constantly getting into these cultural conversations, but we never do anything. And so I contacted Robert and asked him if he would take a look at my play, The Uncanny. And after eight years, nine years later, uh, it is actually going up after COVID and all kinds of uh, tragedies that we went through. Uh, and I'm just so excited about it. Uh, Robert Cooperman is the founder of Stage Right Theatrics. It's the country's only conservative theater. It's the home of the Natural Theater, which I want to talk about. Uh, they produce the annual Conservative Theater Festival, uh, as well as plays by conservative artists across the country, and now me. Uh, and Robert is also a theater contributor for the Epoch Times and the host of a podcast called Stage Right. Uh, and his stuff for Epoch Times is really fascinating if you're into theater. Robert, it's good to see you. How are you? Great to see you. I'm doing great. And thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. It is a real pleasure. I, I, it's hard to uh, communicate to people what it means to have somebody running a right-wing theater. Uh, I once said to the head of equity, I was thinking of starting a theater, and he burst out laughing. He said, uh, God bless you. You'll never make a penny. How do you survive running a, a conservative theater? You know, we survive with through the generosity of donors who uh, b- believe in our cause and thank us for being there. Um, and I also survive through grants from local grant uh, issuing organizations in the uh, general Columbus area. Um, and, and that's how I'm able to survive. And, and you know, on ticket sales, it, it's it's a real shoestring budget, but yeah. we managed to do it. And do, and do audiences show up? I mean, are audiences, are there conservative yeah, audiences? Audiences, for yeah. audiences are growing. You know, it's, it's, I've been in existence about six and a half years. And it is, it is difficult to get uh, not only the, you know, theater community to come because they're opposed to my existence, but also to get an audience to come and to get that, inf- that get that message out there through, um, through marketing. But my audience has grown each year. And, you know, Drew, what's ironic, I guess, is that the pandemic actually grew my audience. Ah. And the reason for that is because I was not going to shut down live theater during the pandemic. But the only way I could do it was to offer virtual live streaming. And through that, we were able to get people from all over the country and some out of the country watching our shows uh and so you didn't have to just be in the columbus ohio area to see a production by stage right and so now i live stream every one of my productions and we the audience grows and more and more people hear about it more and more people talk about it and more and more people attend this is you know it's an amazing thing because people don't know this but a lot of uh plays start out in the country and then they make their way to New York or sometimes to LA. And of course, we, the right wing, are going to be banned because they have a virtual monopoly on the theater. So because we've been cut out of the culture so much, conservatives don't, there are some conservatives who don't know a lot about it. I can imagine conservatives saying, what difference does it make if, if they own Hollywood, they own so much of the publishing industry, uh, so much of TV, what difference does one little theater in Ohio makes? 
uh, does one little theater in Ohio make? Uh, can you answer that question? Because I think it's important. You know, I think that for conservatives to really become involved in the arts, and by that I mean by the creation of art, um, we really have to do it from a grassroots level. Mm. So, um, I, I, you know, the old saying is you don't start out as chairman of the board. Well, you don't start out on Broadway. Um, it starts, as you described, from these small pockets in different areas of the country. And, and that's how it needs to grow. I think if we do this from a grassroots level, which I'm trying to do, then um, it will have lasting power. So it's not just a one and done and it's not just this, you know, shot in the dark. Um, and you have to have, you know, if you're going to do something like I'm doing and people tell me I have guts, you, you have to do it with real perseverance and you have to do it um, knowing that you're going to get knocked around and you're going to get, you know, verbally spat at. But you have to keep believing in the cause and people will come to it. So, you know, it's a gradual thing. And like anything else, if it heats up quickly, it's going to die quickly. So it's taking me already. I'm in six years going and, you know, I can see another six and another six until this really grows. But I think it starts from the grassroots level. And it's, the streaming is huge because, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get, I'm getting the uh, movie guys of the Daily Wire to watch, and I'm trying to get my agent uh, in L.A. to watch, although he's a, a left winger. I'm not sure <laughs> how much I can get at him, but at least, I, at least I don't have to say to him, you know, you have to fly to Columbus. You can just watch it. So it, it makes a big difference. Right. Um, now, you, you recently changed. I've been reading your stuff in the Epoch Times, and you changed from saying you're specifically a conservative theater to saying you're into natural theater. Uh, I, I think this is like a really important concept and something that should that people should understand throughout the arts and throughout uh, the culture. Can you explain what natural theater is as opposed to conservative theater? Sure, sure. You know, look, I'll just start by saying I will never not be a conservative. Um, but I think the, the, I'm rebranding myself as the natural theater. We call ourselves the home of the natural theater. Um, and I trace this back really to the founding of our country. The founding philosophy really plays a major role here in the creation of the natural theater. Um, you know, Jefferson said it eloquently in the Declaration of Independence, all human beings are born with rights bestowed on them by nature's God. And, and of course, we know those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we all therefore have these natural rights that precede government. And Madison, uh, in particular, recognized that we are guided by human nature, for better or for ill. So my question that I asked myself as I was thinking, you know, conservative theater is a little bit polarizing, uh, because once people hear that, they don't want to hear any more. Um, you know, they hear conservative theater and it's, you know, I, well, I'm not going to that, or I'm not going to work for that company. So I asked myself, how can this be, this, these ideas that the founders gave us, how can this be portrayed and reinforced through the arts? And even should it be? And my question, my, I answered that question rather quickly. Yes, of course it should be. Um, why are we spreading the message? Why aren't we, excuse me, spreading the message of what America stands for? And which, you know, it should be noted, the, the founders were really transcending America to talk about all people of the world. You know, the, the founders didn't say that only people within the borders of the United States have these natural rights. So I developed the concept of the natural theater to kind of be an artistic counterpoint to, to art that suggests that we are adrift in this meaningless and, and mean spirited universe uh, where where we are all blameless victims constantly in search of relief through through violence or sex or or drugs and and there's no hope or redemption in sight and i've always felt that the founders philosophy had a great deal of hope and a great deal of redemption possible in that we human beings recognize our own failings due to human nature so i want to present protagonists who search themselves to find fault within themselves for the conflicts they face. I want human nature to be the cause of theatrical conflict. Hmm. And, I, and I want the plays of the natural theater to be about something grander than this futile search for meaning or this personal exploration of, uh, you know, how a person is 
unjustly wrong through no fault of his or her own. You know, yeah. I want protagonists who say, I have a piece, I, I own a piece of that problem. And, and then it can be solved. And you know, Drew, I'm not talking Pollyanna here. Yeah. I'm not talking that everything's, you know, happy and, and, and you know, the, the uh, infamous or f happy ending. I'm talking about the, the plays that can, can have suffering. But the, the thing is, the key difference is that this suffering brings about understanding and it brings about a meaning that it can apply not just to this protagonist, but to all of us. Yeah. in this communal because, setting. Because, I mean, so, life is like that. I mean, we do trust that, that right. suffering leads to something, it leads to character and, and leads to wisdom. And, you know, I, I don't think I want to see, I mean, the left will actually make movies in which they sell leftism. I mean, they will actually make those yeah. films in which they sell social. But I don't actually want to see that. I don't want to see it on the on the right. What I want to see, I mean, what would it be like if we wrote uh, plays and movies and books that said, "Oh yeah, slavery is just as good as freedom." You don't. You can't say that. It's just not true. You know. So the the na right. nature we trust that nature is on our side in a way, and human That's nature right. is on our side. Yeah. I mean, it makes it That's makes right. a a huge difference. And I mean, do do you get attacked? I mean, you must get attacked. I, I assume, or at least ignored. I mean, I get both. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, I get. I, I definitely get ignored. Um, and I do get attacked. Look, I haven't, uh, they haven't had any protesters outside my theater company yet. However, that would be great for publicity. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll try to bring some, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah by all <laughs> means. Um, but I, I get attacked regularly on social media. Although I have to say the attacks have lessened to some mm -hmm. degree. I mean, people don't want to be bothered with my company. Again, just here in conservative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but, um, the attacks are fewer and far between now, I find, at least within the community here locally, because a number of people have worked with me and worked with my company, and they've come to realize that, number one, we're not going to bite your head off, and number two, we're not going to sit around and talk politics. We're going to produce plays. Yeah. And one of yeah. the things I always say, and even in my marketing materials, is we don't care what baggage you bring. The only thing you need to be a part of stage right theatrics is a love of theater. Mm, yeah. And it's, those it's, people who, embr who embrace that have worked with me for years. Well, speaking of that, I, th I think we have to talk about the uncanny. I'm so, I'm really excited about this, Robert. I mean, I'm, I'm a little nervous. What's but that? I'm, uh... <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry. I didn't have my notes. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm, I'm nervous about it, but I'm, I'm wondering how it's going. I haven't seen a, a th part, any part of it. So uh, I'm wondering how it looks. It is. It is shaping up to be about the best production stage right that's has ever I, done. That's what I want to hear. And, uh, well, you know, look, it all starts with a great script. Oh, wow. And <laughs> qu quite honestly, I've read it the first time, loved it. Read it the second time, loved it even more. And then you and I had a conversation because some of the elements that you had in the script were going to be very difficult for me to do on a stage. I mean, I'd yeah. have to have one of those Broadway houses with, uh, you know, deep pockets to yeah. do that and the equipment to do that. What we did was we took some of the elements of the script that you had written in there about uh, the history of this ghost story, the Black Annie ghost story, through the centuries. And rather than stage them, which is what how you had it in the script, I talked to the director and he was a film guy. Mm. So he said, let's film it. Mm. And we went all out. We went to a castle in Ohio. Believe it or not, there's a castle in Ohio <laughs> uh, that's not Ohio made castle. of Legos. Yeah. A and um, we we got the authentic costumes and we filmed, you know, late at night. So it was atmospheric. And so we have incorporated stage and film. It's the most adventurous I've ever that's been. That's great. But it's worth it for this for this script. Oh, that's great. I'm, so, I'm really excited and I'm going to be there. What am I? I'm going to be there Saturday, not this Saturday, but next Saturday to May do a 21st. talk back. And and so people first, we should tell people how they can get tickets. What's the easiest way to get tickets? Easiest way to get tickets is to go to my website, which is stagert.org, stagert.org, and you will see it pretty prominently there to go uh, click on to buy your tickets, and you can get in-person tickets if you are in Ohio or want to travel to Ohio, but you can also get those uh, live streaming virtual tickets 
for and, every, and the, every night of the performance. And the live streaming, do you have to watch it live? Do you have to watch it while it's going on, or can you watch it later? No, you, you, you can watch it later. Um, I, I'm fairly certain that uh, that link will be up for a while, but I always okay. have a copy of it. So if somebody bought a virtual ticket and said, you know, I didn't get to see it, we can get them a copy of it okay. to watch. Great. As if it well, were I'm, live. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to meeting you in person and uh, to Same seeing here. the play. It's, I'm very excited about it. It really is a thrill. I love the theater, and it's so nice to know that a theater is out there that actually has uh, human beings at its core. Uh, <laughs> Robert Cooperman, Stage Right Theatrics, thank you so much for coming on, and I'll see you on Saturday. I'm looking forward to it, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me on. So I saw on Twitter, somebody said, what are the four words that every woman wants to hear? And somebody answered, rockauto.com. <laughs> that, that is so true. Why? Because when you say rockauto.com, not only do you sound a lot cooler than you actually are, but a woman knows that you are smart enough not to leave your car sitting in the driveway where it can't go because it needs a part, but you can go right on your computer and get rock auto.com's terrific catalog with their low prices for auto and body parts from hundreds of manufacturers. It's that way you say it, though. It's a rockauto.com because their catalog is unique and remarkably easy to navigate. You can quickly see all the parts available for your vehicle and choose the brand, specifications, and prices you prefer. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, and the women just, just fall down. They just love that rockauto.com. So go there right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right click. Yeah, same way. How did you hear about it in there? How did you hear about us, Box? So they know I sent you. It's K-L-A-V-A-N. There are no E's. Don't even make it sound easy. It's the most infamous Supreme Court case in memory. It's the deadliest decision in history. But even 50 years after Roe v. Wade, few know the full, gruesome truth behind the landmark decision, a decision that's enabled the destruction of over 64 million babies. The Daily Wire has taken a wrecking ball to the four big lies the abortion industry was built upon. Watch our original documentary, Choosing Death, The Legacy of Roe, streaming today, and uncover the inside story of how Roe v. Wade came to pass and why it needs to pass away. You'll hear the facts and stories the abortion regime has suppressed for generations and get a clear-eyed view at the brutal reality they desperately don't want you to see. Some of this content is hard to take in, but few subjects, if any, are more important. Here's the trailer. Um, many times when we did this, as we started, uh, patients would began crying and protesting. But once we had begun dilating the cervix and passing instruments into the uterus, it was too late to stop. I was handing hush money to women who we had left pieces of their baby. We had put these women's lives in jeopardy. We had put their lives at risk and we were literally giving them a check for $800. And for a poor woman, $800 is a lot of money. I mean, there have been so many moments in the last decade plus of going undercover in abortion clinics myself and seeing just heartbreaking things. Women vomiting in the hallway of an abortion clinic, crying out in pain. The late-term abortionist talking casually about how they would literally leave a born alive baby to die. Or if you deliver the baby in the toilet, then you pick it up and stuff it in a plastic bag and bring it to us. Babies are being born alive and the backs of their necks are being slit. They are being drowned. Um, their necks are being snapped. It's, it's happening more often than people want to think about. These abortion facilities, these abortion providers, these doctors, they don't care about these women. And you're just, you're realizing it, you're watching in front of your own eyes play out America's greatest horror story, which is how we butcher children in the name of choice. Oh, 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 oh,
You know, um, I, I wrote the screenplay to the film Gosnell and researching stories like the ones you just heard gave me nightmares almost every night. Uh, but I would trade many nights sleep uh, to put an end to this. So please help us expose the truth. Uh, tell your friends to watch. If you're not already, become a Daily Wire member and tune in today in our, to our documentary on abortion, Choosing Death, The Legacy of Roe. Go to dailywire.com slash choosing and join the fight today. So a couple of years ago, I think it was 2019, uh, there was a shooting, uh, I believe in Florida, and the Greensboro and North uh, Carolina City Council got together to discuss p- potential uh, restrictions on gun rights. And a single guy got up, uh, Mark Robinson got up and gave a speech that went viral. And here is just a brief clip of that. This is cut 17. I've heard a whole lot of people in here talking tonight about this group and that group and domestic violence and blacks these minorities and that minority, what I want to know is, when are you all going to start standing up for the majority? And here's who the majority is. I'm the majority. I'm a law-abiding citizen who's never shot anybody, never committed a serious crime, never committed a felony. I've never done anything like that. But it seems like every time we have one of these shootings, nobody wants to blame, put the blame where it goes, which is at the shooter's feet. You want to put it at my feet. You want to turn around and restrict my right, constitutional right that's spelled out in black and white. You want to restrict my right to buy a firearm and protect myself from some of the very people you're talking about in here tonight. It's ridiculous. I don't think Rod Serling could come up with a better script. (laughs) So when I lived out of the country, I was an expatriate for seven years. And the thing I missed most was that American voice, the the blunt, straightforward straight-talking American voice that is unafraid to say what he has to say. Uh, And the minute I heard this clip, I thought, that's that voice. That's that voice that I missed. A lot of people must have felt the same way because Mark Robinson was then elected lieutenant governor of the state of North Carolina, despite the fact that a lot of his opponents uh, had outraised him. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, thank you so much for coming on. It's a real pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm having a little difficulty here this morning. <laughs> oh, that's all right. <laughs> we'll, we'll try and make it through here. Uh, yes, so, sir. Thank so you. Ex- explain this now. Your, your governor is a Democrat, so I'm assuming yes. that you run on a separate ticket than he does. We do. Separate ticket, completely separate, uh, separate offices, uh, separate duties. Uh, would be wonderful if we could work together, but uh, he's chosen to close his office off, even to some members of his own party, it seems like, and to most of the people of the state, he doesn't listen to what they're saying. And uh, he's been an island all unto himself. And so uh, he's chosen to do that. But I would love to be able to work with the governor, but he's he's unwilling to do that. So, so you now have a, if he has to step down for any reason, do you take over his office? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. If he were to leave. In fact, in fact, this is an inter- this is interesting. Uh, back when there was the talk about uh, candidates running for the United States Senate, uh, he was actually on an interview, and uh, the the interviewer asked him if he would be interested in running for the Senate. And uh, and the braggart uh, that he is, he said, uh, "Yes, uh, I have thought about it, and I know I could win." But he said, "I chose not to do that because if I did that, Mark Robinson would be the governor, and I don't think North Carolina needs that." <laughs> I think it's exactly what North Carolina needs, though, and so do a lot of other people. It is, well, it's nice to have friends in high places. Uh, but, uh, Absolutely. So in, in the meantime, what does the lieutenant governor in North Carolina do? Well, my main duty is I'm the president of the Senate. Uh, huh. But when the Senate is not in session, uh, I sit on the state school board, which has become uh, a, 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 it's a Herculean task uh, dealing with education. That's what we've dealt with the most time, uh, most of the time that we've been in office, dealing with issues surrounding education. Uh, we sit on the Board of Community Colleges. We're also the uh, head of the uh, Energy Policy Council. Uh, we've done some work there as well. Other than that, we kind of make our own agenda and uh, we uh, we help the legislature to push the issues that they're trying to, uh, to push to make the lives of, of North Carolinians better. And I think we've been pretty successful in all those things. Can, do you have the same problems with the ed- education as the rest of the country, this woke stuff and the critical race theory and everything? Absolutely. That's the main problem with education. The main problem with education right now is the bureaucrats, those in the high places in education, uh, have led education astray. They're no longer on their primary mission of reading, writing, and mathematics. They're no longer on the 
uh, primary uh, mission of teaching children about the myriad of ways that they can make a living in this country. They're no longer on the primary mission of teaching children about the nation that they live in, under the, the government that they live under, and under the system, uh, the economic system that they live under. There are far too many people that are interested in pushing what they call the woke agenda on these children, and it's not serving them well. We spent half of our $26 million budget we spent on public education in this state, and we're unable to teach our children to read on a grade level. We've got to get back to those things that we do that we do best in education, which, which is the, the, the three primary things, reading, writing, and mathematics. And we've got to get a healthy dose of discipline back into our hallways and classrooms. Do you have a chance of doing that, do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. We've already started that course, uh, started down that road. Uh, when I took office, we started a task force called the Ta FACTS Task Force. It stands for Fairness and Accountability in the Classroom for Teachers and Students. The, the mission there was to expose some of the indoctrination that's going on across the state. We took examples uh, and allowed people to call our office and email our office from all across the state. We compiled that data and we disseminated it out to news agencies and others uh, to give that proof and that data that this is going on. And uh, now we're going to chart a course on how to combat it. So one of the things that just every time I hear you, I heard you uh, giving a speech about transgenderism the other day. And every time I hear you, I just hear this, this Amer American voice. I mean, I'm old enough to remember that American voice, and it's got, kind of been ch chased out of the uh, public sphere. And one essential thing about it is that it's oh, you're openly religious. You openly speak uh, in terms of your religion and in terms of God. Uh, first of all, let me ask you: Is that do you mean to do that? Is that uh, is that something you bring to that naturally? Absolutely, I, I do that intentionally. Number one, I do it because for much of my life, I was not really outspoken about my religion. I, I was kind of shot away from it. Uh, I didn't feel like I had a right to stand up and say that I was a Christian. I didn't feel like I uh, necessarily should be saying that I, that I thank my, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for everything that he's done for me. But, you know, after growing up and realizing what he has done for me, he, I realized, number one, he's worthy of me doing that and that I should do it. And number two is this. This this goes part and parcel with living in the United States. I don't see any other religion in this country, in this country being demonized. I don't see Islam being de demonized. Uh, Buddhism is not de uh, Buddhism is not uh demonized none of these other religions are demonized whenever they want to come after religion they come after the christians and I, i'm just going to be honest with you i'm tired of it i'm tired of it christians in this nation have done have done more in this nation to raise up the standard of living to stand up for what's right than any other group and i'm i'm really sick of christians being demonized uh, as a whole in this country and i that's why i stand proudly as a christian and profess my my faith uh, proudly yeah, no, it's the most it's the most persecuted religion on earth. There's no question about it. And uh, yes, absolutely. Do you feel that that uh, you feel that that registers with North Carolina voters? It does. It does absolutely. There are so many uh, what I call, and this sounds funny saying it. There are so many closeted Christians out there, people who go to work every day, uh, people who go to school every day, who feel like they have to hide their Christian faith because they feel like they're going to be demonized for it. That should not be happening. Uh, this In our nation, we have uh, religious freedom, and that that, uh, that that should permeate every part of uh, facet of society. No one should be running around being afraid to profess their Christian faith. Yeah. No, I think one of the biggest mistakes that we've made is allowing them to take religion out of the public square and, and make us feel like that's, that somehow is constitutionally prohibited, which is just not. I mean, that's just yes, not true. Absolutely. Uh, so, so I looked you up uh, to prepare for this. I looked you up on uh, Wiki, Wikipedia. I don't know if you've ever read your yeah. Wikipedia page. You know, Wikipedia is a left-wing instrument, and they don't like yeah. you very much. I just re got to read you just like two sentences. It says, his political career has been characterized by promotion of conspiracy theories and numerous incendiary statements. And then as, a, as examples of that, they say he opposes abortion, promotes climate change denial, and opposes the legalization of recreational marijuana, all of which sound like perfectly reasonable and popular <laughs> ideas to me. Uh, does does it bother you to be uh, characterized like that? To be, I mean, they they go on, they call you anti-Semitic, they do all the usual left-wing stuff. Does that trouble you? No, in the theater of the absurd, of the absurd which we live in, it does not. Uh, when you look at the the, the people who are promoting, uh, saying that men can have babies. 
and that there's no such thing as women and you have supreme court justices who can't uh I de who can't define what a woman is when my four and a half year old grandson can uh no it doesn't bother me at all to be characterized as a nutcase by people who are nutcases uh these people are obviously left wing they have an agenda they want to turn everything up on his head and uh we're just going to continue to push back proudly against it because the what they're pushing for is just absolute foolishness and we all know it we know it. The, the same people in the world know it so I can't help but listening to you, I can't help but get the feeling that you have your eye on the uh, governor's office. Um, and I'm wondering, what are the issues, if you had to list the issues that, that trouble you most, first in your state, but also in the country, what would they be? Number one issue right now is education because education builds the, builds the bridge to the future. We have got to start teaching our children here in this country about the Number one, get back to, re to teach reading, writing, and mathematics. I've said it a, a, a thousand times. Grades one through five should be dedicated strictly for the proposition of teaching a child how to read, write, and do mathematics proficiently, proficiently, not just on a, 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 a surface level, pro proficiently. By the time a child comes out of uh, the fifth grade, they should be able to do uh, mathematics at, at an outstanding rate, uh, read and write at, at an outstanding rate. And those five grades should be uh, uh, reserved for that. The other grades should be reserved for teaching children about the economic uh, system that they live under, which is capitalism, which has raised more people's standard of living than any other economic, uh, 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 any other, uh, economic dogma than any in the world and uh, teach them about the government they live under, which is not a democracy, it's a, it's a constitutional republic. And we need to get back to teaching our children how those systems work. Once we do that, then we start teaching our children about the myriad of ways that they can make a living in this nation. And there are plenty of ways to make a living. We hear far too often uh, young black children, when you ask them what they want to be, they say, I want to be a football player or a basketball player or a rapper, or I want to be some Hollywood star. That's not where it's at. Where it's at is doctor, lawyer, uh, business owner. You know, we need to start teaching our children about how, what success really is in this country. And that's what education should be. So that's going to be the number one priority we're going to move into uh, when we move, when it, it, you know, moving forward. That's going to be our number one priority uh, is uh, getting our education system back where it should be. The second uh, priority is making sure that we continue on the path that's been started since 2010 in North Carolina. And that path has been to build the economy of this state into an absolute superpower. Uh, the conservative legislature turned this state around and started in 2010. When they talked about lowering corporate taxes, personal taxes, those on the other side of the aisle said the state was going to go broke. That is not the truth. We have a surplus of funds now. Our revenue continues to skyrocket. Our, con our taxes continue to be lowered, and we're reaping the benefits of it. We are most, one of the most admired states in the nation right now. All the other states are looking at us wondering how all these businesses are clamoring to come to North Carolina. Simple, two words, conservative principles. That's why folks are clamoring to come here. We've applied them, and they're working. Does the governor get to take any credit for that, or is he trying to take credit for that? He does. The governor takes credit for it quite a bit. I just saw him on, on TV the other day talking about how North Carolina is on such firm economic footing. Well, I'm here to tell you right now, Mr. Cooper, it doesn't have it doesn't have anything to do with you. If it was up to you, the state would still be in the economic doldrums. We'd still be billions of dollars of debt in, uh, uh, to the federal government, and we would not be moving forward. It has been because of conservative leadership that this state is on the footing this on. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, Governor Vito, and I call him that because he's vetoed more bills in this state than every other governor combined in its history. Mm. The, you know, uh, people like uh, AOC, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know, they sort of say, you know, our whole problem on the left is that we don't double down on our principles. If we really could put radical candidates up there, um, we would win. And in your gun rights speech, you said, I am the majority. Uh, and, and I think that I just think factually that that is the case. And I'm, I'm wondering if your experience now, now you're in office, uh, you're dealing with the public. Is, is that your experience? Are you in the majority, uh, at least in your state? And are, do you think you are the, in the majority in the country? Absolutely. I believe that we are. You know, one of the things that has impressed me more in recent months is this. Uh, the more visible I become to people, the more uh, the more my message is getting shared. Uh, I, I'm not really sure how I've become a star on TikTok. Uh, I don't even think I have that downloaded on my phone. So I'm not sure how I've become a star on TikTok, but I've had a lot of, lot of videos go viral on TikTok. 
And the more our message gets out there, the more I'm meeting what I call non-traditional Republicans who have heard my message, loved my message, and have met me and told me it's because of me that they are now giving the other side a glimpse. And that is what really uh, does my heart good. To see us be able to open people's minds and let them know, hey, those thoughts that are in the back of your mind that are telling you what Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and what AOC and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer are saying is not quite right. It doesn't jive with your beliefs. That voice is real. Listen to that voice, adhere to it, look at other options. And we are that other option. And, and folks are coming over in droves, especially young people. That That is, I, I'm so happy to hear that. Cause I mean, I, I find the minute you leave the coast, the minute you get out of LA and New York and you start to talk to Americans, there's so much common sense out there that they're, and they all are afraid to talk. They all say, you know, I, I don't, I'm not an expert. I don't know. I'm not the intellectual. I don't know. Uh, but they're all smarter than the guys in DC. It's just, uh, it's nice to hear that you're uh, inspiring that. You know, I, I saw one of, one of the speeches I saw, I guess you were in a, a black church and African-American voters are traditionally culturally conservative and yet they keep voting for these guys who deal out programs and ideas. And I was saying this earlier in the show that Democrats treat black Americans with utter disrespect. They treat black Americans as if they can't achieve on their own, as if they can't improve their own lives, as if they can't, uh, you know, they, they have to commit crime. I mean, it's just, it's, it's disgusting. And I'm wondering if, if you reach people, uh, if you reach African Americans in your community and, and they respond to that. Absolutely. As I just said, the overwhelming majority of people that are coming up to me now are young black people. I just, it blows my mind. Every, everywhere I go, more and more, I see young uh, black North Carolinians coming up to me saying, hey, I saw your video on XYZ. I loved it. I looked you up. I love what you say. My family loves what you say. We're voting for you. Uh, I'm telling you, we are drawing people out of that uh, political closet uh, more and more every day. People understand, the, the, they understand the basics. They understand that a, a woman, a man should not be competing against a woman in, in w women's sports. They understand that their children, that they should be uh, in control of their children, children's education. They understand that as a business owner, that it is up to them to take care of their employees, the employees and no one should be sh shutting them down or mandating them. They understand all the things around the, uh, the mandates with the vaccines and things of that nature. Just as you said, common sense is alive and well in this country. It's just a matter of politicians going out and telling people, look, I'm not the expert, you are. Together, we are going to solve these problems. That's what needs to be done. And when they see folks doing that, they'll come to them, they'll partner with them, and we can get a lot of these problems solved. When, when you look at, I'm, I'm running out of time, but I just would like to know, when, when you look at the national GOP, uh, if, if they said to you, what, what's the best advice you can give us uh, as a national party, what would you say? The best advice I would say is to speak up. Stop being afraid to spread the truth. One of the problems that the GOP has had for years, we do not share our story. And our story is a great story. We're called the Grand Old Party. Why are we called the Grand Opportunity, great, uh, the Grand Old Party? We're called that because we have a Grand Old Story. I had some folks that wanted to try to change that moniker to Great Opportunity Party. I resisted that uh, mightily because here it is. We have a grand story to tell. We were a party that, were created, that was created to stand up for the republic and stand up for all people. We are the party that ended slavery. We're the party that gave women the right to vote. We are the parties that re party that repudiated Jim Crow. And we are the party now that is standing up for the sovereignty of this nation, standing up for life in the womb, and standing up for the principles that make this nation great. We need to continue to be the grand old party and tell everybody our story. And don't be afraid to do so. Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina, Mark Robinson. God bless you, man. I'd, I'd love to hear what you're saying. And I hope you'll come back and talk to us again. Uh, it's really great to talk to you. We sure will. Thank you for having me. So the Clavenless Week is almost upon you. You're going into the darkness, uh, the absolute destruction. You don't want to go in with your problems. So <laughs> it's time to solve all your problems with the mailbag. Woo! I know you got to be frustrated. I can taste it. <laughs> he is endlessly amusing. I just wish you weren't destroying the country. All right, from Emily, I love listening to your show. I appreciate how you bring joy into everything you do. Uh, in, your mem in your memoir and on the show that you and your wife, you said on your memoir, 
in your memoir and on the show that you and your wife never fight except one time. That's, that's true. Uh, moreover, you have such a positive outlook on everything, even when the news is depressing. My question is, how do you do that? Uh, I am angry, underlined all the time. You've said before, anger is the devil's cocaine, and I'm the living example of that. I try as, uh, as I might, I cannot keep from fighting with my husband. Do you have any advice on how to treat him better, not take out my anger on him, or do you have advice for not being angry, or do you think I'm just a lost cause, sincerely aggravated in Appalachia? You're not a lost cause. Uh, so those are two questions. Where, where does my joy come from, and where does your anger come from? Those are two different questions. Um, you know, it's a corny answer, but it's just the living truth. Uh, my joy does not exist exist without God. Uh, God has hooked me into my joy uh, because he, uh, well, he, he accents my, he, all joy comes from love. All joy comes from love. If you love small things, you get small joy. You love big things, you get big joy. If you love unworthy things, you get unworthy joy. If you love worthy things, you get worthy joy. It is all about love. And through God, uh, if you love God, you're going to be joyful about a lot of things because God is the best thing to love. And I think that it, you pay attention. Uh, life, is, life is short. Uh, God is real. Only the joy matters. And so if you pay attention to the things you love and you love the things you love and you're grateful for them, you will get joy. When Jesus said, stop worrying so much, I know that's a hard piece of advice, but that's how you get there. You get there by focusing on the things you love and 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 the people you love, more importantly. Uh, and, and I think that that you will find, because I, I, I will admit, I'm not going to be modest about that. I am a joyful person. There's no question about it. Um, but I wasn't always, so I know the difference. Uh, Anger, and I have been an angry person as well. Anger almost led me right off the cliff. Um, the reason I say anger is the devil's cocaine is because it, it's not the, the what, what is addictive about the anger is the sense of righteousness and the sense of strength and the sense that you're doing something. You're yelling at your husband, you're telling him the way it is, and he's always doing that and he's always doing this, right? Now, People immediately say, well, there is such a thing as righteous anger, and there is. You know, of course you should be angry if he cheats on you or, you know, he yeah, hurts you or something like that. Of course, that there you should be angry. But you, it's funny in your letter, not funny, I noticed right away in your letter, that you don't say that. You just say that you attack him. And the reason people feel that kind of anger is because they're protecting themselves from more vulnerable feelings, feelings of hurt, feelings of betrayal that may have nothing to do with your husband. They may have to do with how you were grown up or how you feel about your dad or how you feel about your mom or things that bothered you in your youth that you don't, that are set off again. Just to give you a class example has nothing to do with you personally, but your husband forgets to take out the garbage one night and you say, you're always, you know, doing this. You're always, you don't care about me. If you cared about me, you know, you, you get this global kind of thing. And that is not about the garbage, right? Because if we're about the garbage, you know, you'd go clown, you forgot to take out the garbage. You know, uh, it's not about the garbage. It's about something that happened to you when you were young, some kind of uh, sensitivity in you, vulnerability in you that you were protecting with that anger. So the answer is, how do you get to that? How do you start to say things to your husband like, you know, I know I'm being ridiculous, but sometimes when you forget to take out the garbage, I, I have this flashback to my past and all that stuff. How do you get to that point where your husband can start to listen to you and say, you know, oh, I, I understand that, you know, and, uh, um, and either I'll be a little bit more careful about that or look, you know, sometimes I forget I'm a human being. Um, and, and, you know, Therapy helps with that. I mean, a good marriage counselor helps with that. There are books that you can find out about it. There's a book. Uh, let me see if I know. There's a, there's a book that you have to get on Audible. Um, uh, Love, Love Sense by Susan Johnson. Love Sense by Susan Johnson. If you listen to that, that might have some tips. But you might need therapy. You might need help with that. Uh, but again, the anger is replacing something else. It's protecting you from experiencing something else. And that's what you need to get at. There's something in you uh, that is being set off and, and making everything worse than it is. Um, from Evan, Mr. Clavin, in light of the leaked Supreme Court decision, I've been trying to wrestle with the oft-used exceptions to abortion, rape, incest, and health of the mother. I'm a cradle Catholic, a firm pro-life believer. The exception that people cite to health of the mother has me struggling with this idea. I'm not struggling with the idea of pro-life, uh, but if there should be exceptions to the pro-life stance at all, I think I've worked my way through why rape and incest should not matter and abortion should still be pro prohibited in those circumstances. Uh, however, if the choice is between the mother not having a high chance of survival or carrying the baby to term, I feel like that is a valid exception to the rule. I think uh, everybody feels like that. This, the Catholic Church used to say never, but I believe, they, I'm not sure about this, and so I'm saying this from memory, uh, but I believe that they now say no, the health of the mother has to be uh, saved. 
that is uh, that is correct, but it's a tragedy. You know, we we understand that life has tragedy in it, and there's sometimes there's no good choice, uh, and there is no good choice, and you keep the mother because their network of connections is already there, and if if her life is in danger, you say, well, this network of connections uh, is going to trump this. But it's it, you know, it's, it's it's a terrible choice. It's like you know, do you shoot the the little girl if they threaten to drop a nuclear weapon on Chicago? There's just no good good choice, uh, and that's because life is a tragic. Uh, thing and so you know you don't have to get um, you can't get legalistic about some of these things. Um, the the baby has a right to life. The baby has a right to life, and that right is not uh, taken away by the fact that he's the product of rape. But, but that is tragic, and all of a community should come together uh, to help that mother through that tragic experience. But not at the cost of the life of the baby. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense that we solve tragedy with murder. You solve tragedy with life. Life is what solves tragedy. It's the only answer to tragedy is life. Um, and and so, you know, but, but you shouldn't get, you know, you shouldn't tangle yourself up about this. I mean, a um, a mother, like I said, has other children possibly, a relationship with her husband that this baby hasn't had a chance to have. That's a, a tragic, terrible choice. But that, that, but we are way past this idea. When you're talking about healthcare, and I have the right, I have a right to kill that baby. I have a right. That baby is inside me, so I have a right to kill. That's when you're talking nonsense. That's what we're arguing about. We're not arguing about these tragic things. We we all understand the tragic things, and that's why Jake Tapper is a buffoon when he says that thing to the governor of Mississippi. Uh, that's not the issue we're arguing about. We're not arguing about some extraordinary issue. We're arguing about the ninety and over ninety. Percent of of parents who are saying, "Well, I have sex, and nah, you know, I get pregnant, I'll just stop off and kill the baby, and then I go back to having sex, and you know, that'll be fine." We're talking about remembering that your right to life is dependent on the rights of others to life, and that baby is a human being and has that right as well. Went a little long there, and I have to stop, but but it doesn't matter because after this, there'll just be darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth, flames, broken glass. Oh, my God, I can't even think about the, what is going to happen to you after I sign off. However, if you should crawl slowly, painfully, uh, desperately, and just uh, you know hopelessly probably across the field of the week to next Friday, we will be back with The Andrew Clavin Show, and I will be here. I'm Andrew Clavin. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Lisa Bacon, executive producer Jeremy Boring, our supervising producer is Mathis Glover, production manager Pavel Wadowski, editor and associate producer Danny D'Amico, our audio is mixed by Mike Cormina, animations are by Cynthia Angulo, hair and makeup is done by Cherokee Hart, our production coordinator is McKenna Waters, and our production assistant is Jacob Falash. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production, Copyright Daily Wire 2022. Today on The Ben Shapiro Show, Elon Musk puts his Twitter deal on hold temporarily as he examines how many accounts are fake. As baby formula shortages rack the nation, the White House has other priorities, and the media try to pressure corporations to do their pro-abortion dirty work. That's today on The Ben Shapiro Show. Give it a listen. Listen.